good evening, and it's nice to see you, and uh, it's good to be able to be with, with you again tonight. We're just going to open uh, with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for, for all that you mean to us, Lord. As we uh, just take this next bunch of time, as we set it aside and just focus on you tonight, we, we just thank you for the, for the goodness that you uh, bring into our lives. We thank you, Lord, that as we uh, celebrate uh, this amazing season, the Christmas season that is upon us, Lord, is about, about you, Jesus, coming and, and dwelling with us. And Lord, may we sense that tonight. May we understand your closeness tonight as we worship and as we hear from your word. And Lord, as, uh, as we uh, worship you, may you uh, just show up in our midst. Give us a touch from you, Lord, today. Amen. I give you glory for all you brought me through.
night is breaking in a stable for a throne and he shall reign forevermore forevermore and he shall child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. If I were a wise man, I would travel far. If I were a shepherd,
Welcome this evening. I'm glad that you are joining us. And uh, we are continuing in our book of Ephesians, second, uh, Paul's second prayer for these Ephesians. And it, you, well, you're going to see some really unique things within this particular passage. Uh, some of it is very familiar, um, but I think sometimes we, we just need to relook at things to get a clear idea of what those passages really should be meaning and how it should be impacting our lives. So let's pray together. So Lord, we just thank you that you give us these scriptures, that you help us, Lord, to understand your desires for our life. Lord, as we open it up and as we uh, explore this passage, we ask you that you would... Uh, Allow our hearts, our minds, and our spirit to be open to you and what you would have to say to us this day. Amen. Let's read the scriptures together. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. So, Previously, we've seen Paul um, was about to start uh, the second prayer, uh, and he interrupted himself. Uh, he kind of starts, and then he goes into a little bit of an interruption. He picks back up uh, into this prayer. He uh, interrupted himself, describing himself as a prisoner of Christ. 
uh, for the sake of you Gentiles. So he's giving, you know, background, reminding. He wanted to reassure the readers that he was walking in the grace and ministry that God had appointed him to. It wasn't um, onerous. It wasn't difficult. He made a, a very clear under, had a very clear understanding of why he was in prison and what was going on in his life. There was no mystery to him. God had forewarned him about the many things that he was going to have to suffer for the name of Christ. And so he continues. Uh, he, Paul stresses the fact that his apostleship to the Gentiles was a gift to him through the grace of God. He didn't reach out and get and grab this. It was like God gave this to him. Knocked him off his donkey, in fact, <laughs> in order for him to be able to have this ministry. And it was the grace of God, the mercy of God. Uh, he was uh, to preach the Gentiles boundless riches of Christ. I must have cut the T off there. It says the boundless riches of Chris. I don't know who Chris is, but he doesn't have <laughs> boundless riches. <laughs> it's Christ who has those boundless riches for us from the Father. You see, that was this whole plan. Hallelujah. And he says, for this reason, it's for this reason, all of the things mentioned above that he's referred to, that he is now going to go into prayer. Salvation by grace through faith. Uh, by Christ, the Gentiles can now become fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household. Isn't that wondrous? You know, we who were far off have been brought in. Once again, that, I, I love that scripture in the Old Testament. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That's us, us Gentiles. That is what God has done through Christ. So he starts off and he basically says, uh, uh, an invocation is basically the, the beginning of a prayer. Uh, so in this prayer, Paul bows the knee. It's a common throughout the scriptures that people would bow. And often, you know, we get to thinking, well, that's the way that we ought to pray all the time. Um, we can see, uh, you know, this kneeling in prayer in Luke 22 and 41 and Acts 9 and 40 and 20 and 36 and 21 and 5. It's a very common, common practice to, knee, to bow your knee, to kneel in prayer. But it's important for us to realize that it is not the only, the singular way that we ought to pray. And thank God for that, because if I'm driving my car and I need to pray, <laughs> it's okay. I don't need to stop, pull over, you know. And, uh, you know, so God gives us access to him. That's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter the position that we take now. He's given us access to the throne room of God through Christ. So we can stand. We see that in Mark 11 and 25, David sat before the Lord and meditated and, and contemplated. We see it in 1 Chronicles 17 and 16. Jesus fell on his face and Matthew 26, 39, uh, with hands lifted up in 1 Timothy 2 and 8, uh, with heads bowed, we see in Genesis 24 and 26. Folks, I want to make you aware that none of these things are more spiritual than the other. All right? There are some of us who would want to make one position more spiritual. And it's not true. Um, you may do all of these things. In fact, I would encourage you to do all of these things just to experience God in a different way. Sometimes our prayer life can become very, very, very stagnant and we just go through the routine. Folks, so change it up. <laughs> That's why God gave us variety in all of these ways of praying before him. It was not meant to, you know, be 
kneeling down on a mat, you know, and bouncing up and down. That's not the only way. It's what it wasn't meant for you to be, you know, rocking back and forth in front of the temple, you know, wall. God has more for us than a singular way to Him. The beauty is, is that no matter how you approach Him, as long as it's with reverence, He is going to hear you. That's the promise that Jesus has made, that He's made access to the Father for us. So the pattern and example of prayer in this New Testament was uh, uh, to the Father. We often, you know, like when I first got saved, I had no clue. You know, like I was trying to figure out how God, Jesus lives in my heart. And yet he's like, I was trying to figure out all these things because Christians use a lot of language. And I think sometimes we don't really think about all of that language that we use. And so for young Christians, in fact, it's pretty confusing you know, the way that we actually approach things. And so the Bible does present um, in the New Testament the idea that we are to address the Father, um, that we are to um, uh, recognize, in one sense, His headship. Even though Jesus has been made head over all, where there's still this aspect where we are approaching the Father because of what Jesus has done. And that's an important thing for us to address. So, you know, as we're, you know, praying, you know, I always start off, well, well, Father, thank you. And just recognizing that the Father was the uh, one who was most intimately engaged in human uh, life. We go through the Old Testament and we generally see the Father is the one who is interacting. And the reason why the Son has come, you know, uh, is so that we can have access to the Father without the sin being in the way. And that's why the heavens now are open to us who believe in Christ. So we address the Father. And in it's in his name or through uh, the name of Jesus Christ that we can access the Father, as we've already said. We see this in Ephesians 5 and 20 and Colossians 3 and 17. So there is always an understanding that I am accessing the Father through Jesus. You've got to remember John 3, 16, for God the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So we see this. It was the Father who gave us Jesus. And he deserves our thanks and he deserves to be addressed uh, in the way that we pray. Um, not sidestepping, uh, none of those kind of things. That we actually do acknowledge this Trinity relationship. Um, and it's in the Spirit. <laughs> so we've got the whole Trinity involved here. We've, we're praying to the Father in the name or through Jesus Christ. And it's done in the Spirit. We see this in Ephesians 6 and 18 and Jude 20. There is, God wants to be involved. Um, it, that is important for us to recognize and realize that it... Uh, if we were on our own and praying on our own, we would be very, very selfish and self-centered. God wants to take us beyond that, and that's why the Spirit is involved in when we pray, because we start praying as the Spirit wants us to pray. That's why we get tongues. That's why we're you know, told to be led by the Spirit. All of those kind of things. There is an interaction, even in prayer, where the Spirit of God groans within us. The Bible says even with words that cannot be uttered. But there is a, a response to the Spirit, and you'll feel it leap within you, often when, you're, when you take the time to pray. Um, now there's little evidence of anyone praying uh, to Jesus, or even less praying to the Holy Spirit, 
Clearly, it is the Father to whom we address our prayers. We see that in Matthew 6 and 9, you know, uh, you know, when Jesus actually teaches us, you know, how to pray. Now, there is power through his Spirit. Paul mentioned that God's power, the power for us who believe in Ephesians 1 and 19. He is constantly coming back to this theme. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. It's by the Spirit. It is a theme throughout all of Paul's teaching. And we see this continuing here in the book of Ephesians. It is Paul prays that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you, you see. He's making a petition for you and for me that um, we would be strengthened by God's Spirit. That's why he is here. But there's all, it's important for us to work in cooperation with the Spirit. These are not just mere words and somehow, you know, poof, God's going to, with a magic wand, make this thing happen. There is a cooperation. We see this in other passages where you know, we're told to put on. We're told to put, take off. You know, we're, we're told not to, to uh, fulfill the lust. We're told to, you know, walk in the Spirit. We need to understand that this is a cooperative effort that we make with the Lord. And yet, even at its very root, it is the Spirit who prompts us to be cooperative with God for our own sake and for our own good. And so out of God's glorious riches, and we've talked about how big God's glorious riches are, you know, in times past, you know, in, in other sermons. It is so important that those glorious riches, and what are those glorious riches for? They're to strengthen you. We're not talking about Maseratis. We're not talking about, you know, uh, all of those things that you want. We're talking about the fact that God wants to literally strengthen this relationship that you have with him and the way that you live your life. And that's the tone of this entire prayer. God's riches are without limit. You know, we'll often quote, you know, well, my father owns the cattle on the thousand hills. You know, when we're talking about, you know, the need of, of, of uh, material things. But we need to understand this world, it's temporary. Our bodies are temporary. The riches that Paul is referring to here is what Christ has done for us. And they're without limit. He covers every single sin in our life. He covers everything. And he molds us and he shapes us. He never tires of you. <laughs> oh, I am so thankful that he never tires of us. You know, in all of our, our humanity, God still continues to love on us. You know, and that's, that's so beautiful. He's not... <laughs> and this is really cool. You know how when we uh, go and we exercise and we do all this and we put all this energy out, we get tired? <laughs> God never gets tired. He's not diminished by strengthening you. God's, there's no limit. It's like God's never going to get tired of you coming and saying, God, I need your strength. What, again? <laughs> no, that's not our God. And he has never diminished because the Holy Spirit is placed within us to strengthen us and to give us the courage to be able to live for Jesus despite our circumstances or situation. You see, that's important. Not every circumstance and situation is comfortable. But in those moments... Our Father wants you to be strengthened. Ha, God's strength is always available. You know, I'm a pastor, and uh, some people think that we're on 24-7, you know, like, you know, whenever. Well, let me know. I, I, I sleep, okay? And I'm going to let you know sometimes I don't answer the phone. <laughs> Why? 
Because my strength is limited. My, my ability to, to, to be that, that helper, that, those hands, is limited by my flesh, by the fact that I'm walking in a body. Even Jesus was limited in what he could do. And that's why he said, you know, that afterwards even greater things would be done by the church. Because instead of being one individual, Jesus, there would be this multiple of church. But God's strength is always available 24-7. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, he's there for you. When you're in the middle of your day and everything's crushing down onto you, he's there for you. You know, and it is important for each of us to each always realize that he wants to hear from you. He never gets bored, never gets tired of your voice, never gets, you know, huh, what, again? <laughs> I just talked to them an hour ago. You're never going to hear that from God. You might hear from a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to hear it from God. Even we pastors need strength from God and the love from God that, he's that Paul is talking about in this passage. Ah. <laughs> God's strength is administered through his spirit in your inner being. Now, folks, God has given us his spirit for a very important purpose. We can't do this Christian life without his spirit. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want you to understand that that is for you. To be able to have his full measure of strength working inside of you. In your inner being. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is part of the gospel. He wants us to have that fullness, that we would be full of the Holy Spirit. And when we pray and he strengthens us through the Spirit, because the Spirit is the one who dwells within us. God gave us his Spirit that we might be able to walk in front of him. Christians are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Uh, we get a lot of um, preaching regarding, you know, therefore be holy. You know, and I'll, you know, get the finger out and, and um, this kind of thing when it comes to the way that we are living. But God wants not to use this as a finger-waving moment, but rather as a realization moment. There is something holy about your body because my spirit lives within you. So how are you treating your body? What are you doing with it? And it's, it has to, we have to understand it on that level where this spirit of God which dwells in us is not a, not a stranger to the Christian life, but it is, he is, the motivation, the motivator in our life. He strengthens us in our inner beings by his spirit. By the spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. It's true. It is by, as you allow the spirit of God to work in you and put your eyes on the things that God wants you to have, these other things that would grab our attention slowly drop off. Instantly drop off in many cases. But it is by the Spirit that this is done. It is not human discipline, though it's involved. But you know, as well as I do, that human discipline is pretty weak. Especially with, when it comes to things that we're struggling with. We need to understand that God is the one by his spirit that works in us to bring about a holiness so that we reflect who God is. Walking by the spirit. There it comes. 
as we walk by the Spirit, then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the emphasis is not on the idea of give up the flesh. The emphasis here is walk in the Spirit. And as a natural consequence, a natural reaction, a natural response, these worldly, fleshly things will drop away. That's how we ought to be working these things out. Through the Spirit in your inner man. The purpose of, of such strengthening uh, is first hinted at in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You see, once again, <laughs> as human beings, we do not have the ability to, work, to walk with God. It is by His Spirit, as His Spirit influenced, Holy Spirit was sent to convict and to convince us of what Jesus had done for us. And as the Spirit intervened, we came to that place where we were able to be born again. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now that faith increases. As you walk with Jesus, you get to understand how wondrous and how awesome he is. And it just becomes more and more of a, of, of a, a faith that is dedicated to following him. The Spirit strengthens us so that Christ will dwell in the heart of the believer. Remember, the Spirit has come to tell us all about Christ, remind us about Christ, remind us of what he has done for us in establishing a relationship with the Father. The Spirit keeps us active in our faith journey with Christ. He prompts us. He convicts us. He stirs us so that we will continue to understand the priority of eternity and not just this temporal world down here. Now, <laughs> we are to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. <laughs> that is such, such an awesome, awesome, awesome verse. And yet, how do we do this? My, it's like, we, how can I contain <laughs> the measure of all the fullness of God? It is so wild. God has given us all things that pertains unto godliness. You know the Bible tells us that? All things. And it flows out, this whole thing, idea flows out of 17b, that you may be rooted and established in love. When I first became a Christian, I, I was very zealous for the Lord. But I was also very foolish in not understanding that that zealousness ought to be tempered with love. That it has to be rooted and established in love. I was just like, you know, like this militant dude who was doing a lot of stuff for Jesus in the flesh. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got my, kit, my butt kicked a couple of times by fellow Christians disciplining and discipling me that I really learned, and I'm still learning, <laughs> that everything I do for Christ has to be rooted and established in love. In his grace and his mercy and love, we are established as members of his household. It's not because I'm good looking. It's not because somehow, you know, I've gotten a certain age. You know, none of this kind of stuff. It's by grace and mercy and love that God places us in his household. Nothing that we have done, ever, justifies God putting us in that place. It is only his grace, his mercy, and his love for us. And that opens it for everyone in the entire world. 
because he is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. It is his love in us that demonstrates and fulfills the desired change he wants in us. Let's read that again, because I want you to get this. It is his love in us that demonstrates and fulfills the desired change he wants in us. See, it's not just about going to heaven. It's not a single little prayer that says, okay, now you're on your way to heaven, boom. Okay, it is as we allow God's spirit to work within us that we become the individuals that God wants us to be. It is that love we show that demonstrates that we are his disciples. By the love you show to one another, you are showing that you are truly his disciples. That's what Jesus tells us. It's important for us to realize that. God wants us to be filled with this love, having a fullness of love in us. And the only way we can do that is if we are constantly strengthened by the Spirit. Of the five words summarizing the Christian faith, faith and love are explicit here, but grace is implied in verse 16 and truth and hope are implied in verse 19. Love plays a central role in describing the believer's experience with Christ. You know, that's important. It is not just having all of the right thinking. It is experiencing and demonstrating the love, the mercy, and the grace that God has given us. <laughs> Filled is the objective, the goal of what of all that was said previously. The whole idea that we are, this is what God wants for you. Not just a little bit, but filled to overflowing. One begins to be filled as we are strengthened by God the Father. You see, it's nothing in us. We're empty vessels and we need to be poured into and it, we're strengthened by God. Um, and it's through his spirit and Christ then, therefore, dwells within your heart. That's what this whole passage is really telling us. As we allow God to do what only he can do in our lives. With the help of all the members of the Godhead then, one is filled and the more we begin to comprehend, uh, comprehend this wonderful love of Christ, the more that we have this fullness. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. You see, it's Christ living through us, in us, by faith, that God wants to accomplish in our lives. That we would be his hands in this world that we would be at his feet in this world, that we would represent God properly because we have mercy and love and grace. Oh, I'm afraid that when I was a young Christian, I was just not representing God the way I ought to have. I was probably representing more of Bob than I was representing God. And so it is in our lives, and we need to grow in this. We grow in grace. We grow in mercy. We grow in love. And it never, ever stops. Paul's petition that the Ephesians experience uh, all of this together with all the Lord's holy people. So he's not just praying for the Ephesians here. He's praying for us in his prayer that we would be strengthened by the Spirit of God, that we would uh, have this comprehension of the love of Christ. How big, how wide, how deep, you know? 
to know his love that surpasses knowledge. This love is greater than your need. And it's greater than the need of the world. But it has to operate. It has to operate. Love doesn't always make sense. <laughs> and the greatness of God's love goes beyond that which we can comprehend or understand. Why does he love us as human beings? We still shake our heads. Why is he showing us mercy? Why is he showing us this grace? I, he chose to love us. You and I may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. <laughs> wow. That's what God is offering us. No, we, 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 need to be, we need to be careful, okay? Uh, we are foolish to think that the knowledge of God fulfills God's plan for us. Simply having knowledge about God is not God's intention. It's always been relational. Relational with Him first, and then relational with those around us. You know, Jesus comes back, you know, with the answer about what's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, your mind, body, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are twofold things. And this is why God wants to fill you with all the measure of the fullness of God so that this love can be evident in your life and evident in the world. Now, Paul uh, gets down into a doxology. Doxology basically is an ending of a prayer, you know. Uh, he's going, you know, glory to God for what he's able to do. As Paul, he's, he gives praise to God. Um, He's confident God is able to work in the church and to bring glory to God. Remember, this is the whole thing. The Father deserves glory. He deserves a, a, this, this base of, of, of thanksgiving that we have been called to give him because of all that he has done for us. As expressed by Paul, um, God's ability to do it. He can do it. Never doubt that. Never doubt it. He's able to do it immeasurably more than, uh, than all we ask or imagine. It goes beyond. So far beyond. It's immeasurable. Forget your laser measuring tapes. Forget, you know, whatever yardstick you're using. This thing is immeasurable. It's without limit. And he wants you to have it. This great love. According to his power that works within us. You see, this is the whole issue. God working in us to bring about this love, hope, joy. All of the faith Everything that we have that makes us a Christian comes from God's immeasurable riches towards you. Wow. <laughs> and he ends with amen, <laughs> which is a fancy way of saying, let it happen, Lord. Let this happen. And folks, Maybe you need to look at your life and say, am I filled with the kind of love that I need to be filled with? Am I filled with the kind of faith that I need to be filled with? And then challenge yourself because the, it has nothing to do with you working it up or going to a special meeting. It has to do with you allowing God to work within you and pour this into yourself so that you can give out to others. Are your reactions the kind of reactions that Jesus would have? Ouch. <laughs> we all say ouch at that one. And often it's because we haven't spent the time with Jesus. We haven't spent the time asking the Father to strengthen us. 
So I want to encourage you this week, especially as we're moving towards Christmas and it's a harried time and it's even stranger during this COVID time, that God would pour into you this love so that you might be able to pour it out. Let's pray together. So Lord, I thank you just for this word about how great your love is and how without measure, Lord, and how you want to pour it into us. Help us, Lord, to be receptive. Help us to be vessels that have emptied ourselves that waiting to be filled by you. And Lord, we know that <laughs> as you fill us, all of that dross, all of that, uh, those other things, Lord, are kicked out from our mindset, kicked out from the way that we react to people. And so I thank you that your work continues to glorify you, continues forever and ever and ever to give you glory. And so Lord, work your work in us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's read together. Pardon me. You know what? I was getting anxious there, wasn't I? I was trying to end the sermon before. <laughs> oh, my. Paul sees the church. <laughs> Pastor Bob's just going to laugh at himself right now. So Paul sees this church uh, as the means to which uh, glory will be given to God as we've prayed. His glo this glory comes only through Christ Jesus. It is glory that is meant to be generated throughout all generations. <laughs> we are part of the story of the church. That has gone way back all the time, way to, you know, the be very beginnings of the church to this time. We are part of the whole story. And this glory that we're to give God is to continue for all generations. It is a glory that will last forever and ever and ever. Let's read the scriptures together. <laughs> for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, just want to encourage you, keep reading in the book of Ephesians. Uh, don't, I know that Christmas is coming up. We're all tempted to go read the story. But this story of Ephesians is about what Christ did when he came to earth. God bless you.